Greetings and salutations, my fellow sovereigns, and this will be a continuation of our reading from the Magna Carta. And we'll be doing a deep dive and going through the articles, and we'll be using Bill Thornton's website of 1215.org to take a deeper look at some of the interpretations of some of the articles, what they actually mean, and also he has at the bottom a list of definitions. And in the Magna Carta that I will be reading from is the same one that you can get from this same site. If you want to click on the link here, or if you are a member of the Gilded server, you can simply download it off of our chat. And if you'd like to become a member of the Vocational Science Freedom Gilded server, you can go to the Vocational Science Freedom YouTube page and click on the banner up here in the upper right hand corner where it says VSOF Gilded server, and you'll be prompted to answer a few questions, and then we'll let you in. Gilded's the place where we house all of the enormous amount of knowledge that we share with everyone else and where we hold class. And class is also being streamed on the Vocational Science Freedom Odyssey channel because sometimes we say things that YouTube doesn't like. Let's open up the Magna Carta and last time we got to Article 9. Okay, so we covered last time the preamble of what the Magna Carta is. I gave a history of why this document was created, who wrote it, who signed it, all the history of what came before it, which was the totality of the Norman Conquest and the oppression of the English people and the barons who had finally had enough and then forced King John to sign this document in 1215. So I will not rehash that. I'll just get right back into where we left off and just get into analyzing each article from where we left off. So I'm going to start back at Article 9 here. Neither we nor our bailiffs shall seize any revenue for any debt so long as the chattels of the debtor suffice to pay the debt. Nor shall the sponsors of that debt be distrained so long as the chief debtor has enough to pay the debt. So let me break down that first sentence here. Okay, so neither we, meaning us, meaning the king. So whenever you hear any anytime the, the word we is used in the Magna Carta, it means the king and the crown and all of the king's men. Okay, so neither we nor our bailiffs also that would include sheriffs, shall seize any revenue for any debt so long as the chattels of the debtor suffice to pay the debt. So let's go down and look up and read what the definition of a chattel is. So chattel, personal property as opposed to real property, a personal object which can be transported. So in contradistinction here in understanding what real property is compared to a chattel, which is a personal property. So real property, or also sometimes defined as real estate, is land. Okay, so real property, real estate, that's land. You cannot move it. It's there. It's permanent. Personal property or chattel is something that you can move around. So that's your cars and everything else basically that you own other than land. And what would be on the land as well, because what is situated on top of land that cannot be moved, at least easily. Uh, those things are called, uh, and I might be butchering this, but I, I believe it's it's apparentuses or something like that. Anyway, it, it basically means all of the stuff that's stuck to the land, like trees and a castle, per se, or a house, or a root cellar, something that you cannot move off of it. So those are the different ways to understand the aspects of property. So what they're talking about is chattel, so stuff that can be moved. Okay, so let's get back here. Okay, so as so long as the chattels of the debtor suffice to pay the debt. So we're not going to come after and seize any revenue for any debt. So the stuff, so the revenue that's coming in from whoever owes this debt shall not be seized as long as the chattels of the debtor suffice to pay the debt. So whatever the stuff is, if you can give a certain amount of chattel things to pay the debt to whoever it's owed to, and under most circumstances in this time in England, the, basically the only people that were lending money were the Jews. So this is all talking about how we're going to interact with the Jews here. So long as chattels of the debtor suffice to pay the debt, nor shall the sponsors of that debtor be distrained. So what a sponsor is, is someone that basically, in current vernacular, would be something like a cosigner. It would be the most modern term, most likely put towards what a sponsor would be. So it would be somebody else that would be guaranteeing that the debt would be paid if the, the debtor, the original debtor, didn't have it. So, okay, now let's look up distrain. So what does distrain mean? 
so to strain, the act of taking as a pledge another's property to be used as an assurance of performance of an obligation. Also a remedy to ensure a court appearance or payment of fees, etc. Okay, so let's go back and look at this again. So, nor shall the sponsors of that debtor be distrained. So if you were a co-signer, or if you said, hey, yeah, I'll guarantee that this guy pay, the sponsors would not be distrained. So they, the, the remedy would not be used against them. Uh, so long as the chief debtor has enough to pay the debt, right? So as long as he had enough to pay the debt, then the sponsors won't be distrained. But if the chief debtor fail in paying the debt, not having the wherewithal to pay it, the sponsors shall answer for the debt, which means they just have to, they have to then pay it. And if they shall wish, meaning the ones, the sponsors, like the co-signers, if they shall wish, they may have the lands and revenues of the debtor until satisfaction have been given them, meaning the original debtor paid the sponsors, for the debt previously paid for him, unless the chief debtor shall show that he is quit in that respect towards those same sponsors. Now, what does that mean? If he is quit, it means that he's basically completely broken the contract. He doesn't have any possibility to pay. And basically that means that it's all on the sponsors then afterwards. So that means that then they can take the lands and the revenues of the debtor for the debt, right? Okay, so I think everybody understood what this means. And yes, I know this is slightly difficult to read because it comes from a much older form of English. I wouldn't go so far as to say this is that we're necessarily reading old English here. But you also have to remember that the, the Magna Carta was actually written in Latin. So this is a translation from Latin to more modern English. Okay, so that was nine. Number 10. If anyone shall have taken any sum, great or small, as a loan from the money lenders, and again, that's in reference to the Jews, and shall die before the debt is paid, that debt shall not bear interest so long as the heir from whoever he may hold shall be under age. Okay, now there's all kinds of interesting stuff in this sentence. So, if anyone shall have taken any sum, great or small, as a loan from the, I'll just say Jews, and shall die before the debt is paid, so they owed something to the Jews, they died. That debt shall not bear interest meaning the Jews don't get to continue to collect interest on the debt so long as the heir, meaning the one who's the heir of the estate from the original debtor. So the father goes into debt to the Jews, and then the estate is then there, and there is an heir, a lawful heir, to take possession of the father's estate. But as long as the heir from whoever he may hold, and okay, and, and from whoever he may hold, that part, is in reference to what lord the lands actually belong to. That's who holds it. So basically, who has the original fee is, is another way to look at that. So if the king were to owe the lands, that's who holds them, right? So, or sorry, that's who actually owns them. And then whoever holds them are, is the one that's in fee hold, or that's where you get the term feudalism from. So whoever did the feudal pledge to the king to say, hey, I'm going to be on these lands and I'll take care of them and I'll give you so much income from the lands. That then is the one who is, is, whole, is having the lands, but the king is the one to, from whoever he may hold. So he's getting it from the king to hold it for a short period of time. And this is all the aspects of, of feudalism uh, kind of wrapped into one sentence right there. Now, what's someone who's underage? That's someone who's an infant. Now, I'm just going to stop and make a point here to go back up and just kind of reread and show you guys again the importance of coming of full age and what all of this was about as far as transfer of title was concerned and what the barons were so worried about. So I'm just going to reread number three here real quick. But if the heir of any of the above persons, which is the barons and any member of the peerage, shall be under age and in wardship, when he comes of age, and this in sometimes some places in the Magna Carta says comes of full age, he shall have his inheritance without relief and without fine. So what were the barons making sure of? They were making absolutely sure, 100%, that there was no way for anyone to come in between an heir and his estate, that it couldn't be stolen from him, if you will. And clearly, when they have to write it in here like this, that they're talking about getting the loans from the Jews, this is clearly what had been going on. When William the Conqueror came in in 1066, he brought all of the filth of Rome with him. 
Okay? All the serpent seed line, all the scumbags came with him. Well, guess what also along came with that? Roman civil law and the aspect that in Rome they did have things called debtors' prisons. Well, the barons said, no, we're not doing that, which is the reason why still to this day in all common law nation, any nation that adopted the common law of England from it, that obviously used to be part of the empire, all of those nations, doesn't matter what they be, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, or the States, every single one of these nations has laws that state that there shall be no debtors' prisons. Well, why? Because the Jews were taking people and throwing them into jail when they couldn't pay their debt. Well, what good does that do? You can't get blood out of a turnip, but it was just a matter of of them continuing to want to overpunish the debtor, basically. And this is why, you know, Article 10 reads like this, is because this was part of the problem back then, that the barons were saying, okay, no more of this shit. We're not having this Roman civil law filth come in here and say, no, you get to go in jail because you owe us money. Nope, not having it. So, shall be underage, so if he's still an infant, right? If the debt fall into our hands, meaning the king's, because again, our we is talking about the king. And if the debt fall into our hands, we shall take nothing save the chattel contained in the deed. And the in the deed would be whatever the deed said for the loan, right? And again, what's the chattel? It's the stuff that you can move around. So if the debt come under the control of the king, we shall take nothing save the chattel contained in what the contract said, nothing more. That was the point. They were making a point here in Article 10 to say, okay, if you made a contract with the Jews, okay, that's fine, but this is how we're going to take care of it. Absolutely, and this is going to be the common law, the law of the land, and you cannot alter this. Period. Full stop. So they had to write this all out to make sure that none of this other shit cannery was going to go on. Okay, so that's 10. Number 11. And sorry, I don't have chat up. Let me get up chat just in case anybody else said anything. Yeah, the pronunciation of that word that I, that I butchered. Appurtenance. Okay, appurtenance. That's how you're supposed to say it. Got it. Okay. But that says appurtenance is a accessory item associated with particular activity or style of living. Well, because I know that that word that I was thinking of had to do with things that were attached to the land. But I think, I think it was that word that has been used in the past. It probably has a different legal meaning is what I'm guessing. And that's the connection to the stuff with the land. But thank you for looking that up, Joe. Okay, so, all right, so we did 10. All right, now not on to 11. And if anyone dies owing a debt to the, and I'm just going to say Jews, his wife shall have her dowry. So again, you, you can't take everything away from the wife, right? So the wife is still going to have her dowry, which means she's still going to be able to live out the rest of her existence without the Jews totally decimating her and turning her into a pauper. And shall restore nothing of that debt. But if there shall remain children of that dead man, and they shall be under age, the necessities shall be provided for them according to the nature of that man's holding. Meaning, if he was a, a baron or an earl, well, then you're not going to take away from the children what they'd been accustomed to having, right? According to the nature of that man's holding. So if they were fairly well-off people, again, you're not going to turn around and turn the children into say, peasants, if they were raised as, or in a, in a lord's house is basically what they're getting at. And from the residue, the debt shall be paid, saving the service dues to the lords. The service dues is what they're talking about when they're talking about the administration of the rest of the estate. So the lords and those that are administers of such lands and various different things, they get to take a certain amount for the administration. This is getting into this service due was if someone was administering these things for the, the heir, the infant, who had not yet come of full age already, right? So they, you don't get to take that away from the lords that are doing the administration. So they get paid also, and so the Jews can't take away from that either. Okay, so in like manner shall be done according to debts that are due to others besides money lenders. Uh, wait, let me think about that for a second. In like manner shall be done concerning debts that are due... Oh, two others. Okay, so what they're saying is we're going to lay this down as an absolutism for all debts, regardless if they owe the Jews or not. So anybody, anybody else that they might have gotten money from, even if it not be the Jews. Twelve, no scotage or aid shall be imposed in our realm unless by the common council of our realm, except for redeeming our body and knighting our eldest son and marrying once our eldest daughter. 
and for these purposes there shall only be given a reasonable aid. In like manner shall be done concerning the aids of the city of London. So there's a whole bunch of unpackaging here. Okay, so let's go down and look up the definition of that word, which I might potentially be butchering there. So scutage attacks a contribution raised by someone holding lands by knight's service used to furnish the king's army. Okay, so let's go back. So no tax. So basically we'll, we'll refine this as tax. Okay, so what they're saying is that the taxes that are going to the king, uh, to raising his army or aid, so no tax or aid shall be imposed in our realm unless by common counsel of our realm. Again, this is kind of the king saying, I'm not going to do anything just kind of off the top of my head with any of these taxes and things that are already known to be what they are, unless by the council of the realm. Except for redeeming our, and, and then this is the things that he doesn't have to ask permission for the council for, except for redeeming our body and knighting our eldest son and marrying once our eldest daughter. And for these purposes, there shall only be given a reasonable aid. In like manner shall be, in reasonable aid meaning that we, the king, shall ask for monies, taxes, from you guys to do these things. Okay. In like manner shall be done concerning the aids of the city of London. So, yeah, we can tax you for doing just these couple things, but guess who's guess who else gets to, you know, ask for reasonable aid? Oh, the city of London. Right. Now remember, the city of London is not part of England. It was a Roman city-state, always has been, and it was laid down in 43 AD by the Romans, and they have kept that piece of land ever since. And that's why the queen, or king at the moment, has to ask permission before they enter the city of London, because they do not own it. And I spoke all about the city of London in the first episode of this, so just go rewatch it, but I'm not going to rehash it here. Okay, so that's number 12. 13. And the city of London, again, talking about the Roman filth, shall have all its old liberties and free customs as well by land as by water. So we're not going to touch the city of London. Very interesting thing here. The barons are saying, hey, cult of Rome, we're not going to mess with the city of London. You know, that thing can stay there and do what it's been doing ever since. So we're not going to go busting that up. There was kind of a sort of a concession, if you will, by the barons to Rome, right? To say, hey, we're not going to mess with that. Moreover, we will, and this is continue reading here from 13. Moreover, we will and grant the other cities and boroughs and town, that should be towns, and ports shall have all their liberties and free customs. So any other municipality, okay, any other thing, little city-state or other little corporation that's running a city or a borough or a town, right, shall have its liberties and free customs, meaning that they can do what they need to do at, under Roman civil law, which is what municipal law is, to do whatever they've been doing, and we're not going to mess with that. So again, this, they're kind of putting this clear dividing line up between what is common law and what is Roman civil law, right? And they're saying, we're not going to come busting down and destroying all the aspects of Roman civil law that have been laid out. However, we are creating this whole entire thing called the Magna Carta so that you bastards on the other side know where the line in the sand is coming this direction too. So we all know where everybody stands and we're not going to cross this line anymore, right? Well, there was still a lot of crossing of the lines later, but that's history for another day. Or if you want to learn the rest of what happened after the Magna Carta, you can go listen to the timeline class, which is on Odyssey, because I cannot post it onto YouTube, which is under the playlist. So if you go to the VSOF on Odyssey and then go to the timeline class, VSOF timeline class, Lies and Thievery of 4,000 Years, the old world history anew. If you want to learn the rest of what happened after Magna Carta, go, <laughs> go listen to that. And I explain all of it. So, okay. So basically they're saying they're putting the line in the sand. This is common law. Roman civil law is over there. Stay there. All right. So that's what 13 says. 14. And in order to have the common council of the realm in the matter of ascending an aid, Otherwise, then in the aforesaid cases, meaning all the other times that we can ask for aid, or of assenting a scoage, meaning that, that tax of the aspect of furnishing the king's army, we shall cause under seal, through our letters, the archbishops, bishops, abbots, earls, and greater barons to be summoned 
for a fixed day for a term, namely at least 40 days distant, meaning we're going to give you 40 days to get there, and for a fixed place, meaning it's not going to move, and moreover we shall cause to be summoned in general through our sheriffs and bailiffs all those who hold of us in chief, meaning who's holding our chief lands. So that's anybody that they hadn't already mentioned above. It has pledged feudal service to us and basically is of our hold, meaning again that aspect of holding the lands for the king and giving him the revenues. And in all those letters of summons, we shall express the cause of the summons. And this is a really important thing because what they're laying down here is kind of the beginning of what due process is and the things that we still do to this day as far as court summons, as far as serving, like process serving someone a suit against them. Say, hey, I'm suing you. I have to process serve you to make sure that you have notice of what I'm coming after you for. And e even just giving general notice, even s mailing a notice to someone to say, hey, will you stop stepping on my toes? And these are the reasons you should stop stepping on my toes. And here's the law or here's the contract or whatever it may be. This aspect of notice and that if we're going to summon you to some place, we're going to tell you the express cause of the summons. We're not going to just say you have to show up 40 days from now in such and such castle. We're going to tell you why. Okay. And to continue here. And when a summons has thus been made, the business shall be proceeded with on the day appointed according to the counsel of those who shall be present, even though not all shall come who were summoned. So meaning, even if everybody doesn't show up, we're going to take care of business, whoever's there, and that's going to be considered to be a quorum for whatever it is we, meaning the king, uh, summoned everyone to come talk about, whatever that may be. And again, this again, then again, he's talking, in, the whole thing is an aspect of basically this this tax thing or aspects of taxes. Right, so the, so the aforesaid cases or assessing scourge, we shall under seal in our letters to these people, say, come in 40 days to a specific place and the reason. This is, again, what the, the barons were being pissed off about was that the king was just willy-nilly creating taxes here or there for one thing or another and not ever really describing why he was doing it. And the barons had pretty much had enough of that. And there were a lot of other abuses that came long before king john that were of this same kind of nature where a king would just decide to do something and not inform the barons or not really have any lawful reason to do it and the barons were pretty pissed off about this and they'd pretty much had enough of it so yeah so that's basically what 14th about okay so on to 15 we will not allow any one henceforth to take an aid from his free man save for the redemption of his body and the knighting of his eldest son, and marrying once of his eldest daughter, and for these purposes, there shall only be given a reasonable aid. So again, this aspect, so what aid is, again, is this aspect of like taxing, basically, is, is what it is. They didn't, it wasn't called a tax, and they don't have aid in here, but um, but that's more or less what they're talking about. You, could, you should think of an aid kind of like a tax. So when you read it like that, it makes more sense. So I'll read 15 again. So we will not allow anyone henceforth to take an an aid, or so take a tax, uh, from his freemen. Okay, so what the king's saying is that the king, or any of the barons or earls, anyone who owns land, shall not be going and taking taxes from his free men, meaning the men that are, that are free, save for the redemption of his body. So that's the, the redemption of the aspect of putting him to rest and having a church service and so on and so forth. And the knighting of his eldest son. So you could ask for a tax for doing these various different things for the knighting of his eldest son and the marrying wants of his eldest daughter. So that doesn't mean that she can go get married and divorced and married and divorced and married. It just wants of his eldest daughter. And for these purposes, there shall be given a reasonable aid. Now, of course, reasonable is up to the interpretation of the reader, I suppose, or the king or who would ever be asking for uh, this little aid. But again, that would be an aspect of people getting together or the council getting together and saying, yeah, that's not reasonable. Just the same way that we do with a 12 member jury or a 25 member grand jury. Okay, so that's 15, so 16. No one shall be forced to do more service for a knight's fee or for another free holding than is due from it. So that's saying that 
whatever is the amount of service that you're owed the king for a knight's fee. And a knight's fee was a a bit of land that a knight got to be able to sustain his needed income enough so that he could have armor, have a horse, have a squire that he could hire, and be ready for battle when the king called him. So that's what you should think of as a knight's fee. And again, fee, the aspect of fealty, fidelity, feudalism, these all stem from the word fee, which is what that was. It was that pledge to the king to say, yep, I'll come to fight whenever you call me. And the king would then have the knight have so much land to be able to have an income enough to do that when the king required that he do so. So that's the all aspects of a knight's fee. Okay, so no one shall be forced to do more service for a knight's fee or for another freeholding than is due from it. So you can't over basically overtax anybody. Okay, so 17, common pleas shall not follow our court, but shall be held in a certain fixed place. Okay, why did they have to put that in there? Well, when you had to do business with the king, but say the king was out gallivanting in France trying to extend his kingdom, or was out and about in the rest of the realm somewhere, and not, say, in London, then you had to go to wherever the king was, because that's where his court was. Because you have to remember what a court is. A court is the sovereign and his suite. Now, the word suite turned into suit. But what a suite was were all of the people that followed around the king and remembered what happened before and in the presence of the king. That was the court. So, whenever you're out and about, or whenever the king was out wandering around, wherever he was, that was where his court was. And same goes for any of us. All of us who are sovereign. Wherever you are, that's where your court is. You hold court where you are. Unless necessarily you lay down a specific fixed place of which you wish to hold court. Like say when you file suit against someone and you do an action of trespass or trespass on the case and you say, I'm suing you in a court of record and it's going to be at this certain fixed lo location, this certain fixed place, right? But now that certain fixed place does not necessarily have to be in the county courthouse. Because I have read several treatises, particularly ones on on process, meaning common law process of how to do proper writs, wherein it was written more than once, where someone would sue someone and their fixed place would be a hotel room. Now, of course, this was early, 18, early mid to late 1800s in America, but nonetheless... That was where they were holding court, because perhaps there wasn't a fixed courthouse someplace out there in the Wild West, which there usually wasn't. So they held court wherever they could. So court is where you are. That's what it is. But the reason they had to write 17 was because they were sick and tired of having to follow around the king everywhere to get shit done. So they said, nope, you're going to be in one fixed place. And this eventually became Westminster. So uh, 18... Assizes of novel this season of Mort de Centaur and of Darien present shall not be held save in their own counties and in this way. So let's read what this is before we get into what the way is here. Okay, so what's an assize? A court usually, but not always, consisting of 12 men summoned together to try a disputed case. Hmm, sound familiar? They perform the functions of jury except the verdict was rendered from their investigation and knowledge and not from upon evidence abducted. Okay, so in a seize... Okay, that's interesting. I didn't actually know this. So they performed the functions of a jury, except the verdict was rendered from their own investigation and knowledge and not from upon evidence abducted. Okay, so when a seize was basically a jury that could do its own investigation... I guess. Sounds like it. Okay. So, okay, so that's an assize. So that's a kind of court that function, and they did the verdict of, what's the next word? Deceason. So 
to dispossess or to deprive, okay? So this court's going to, this type of court is going to novelly deprive someone of mort de center. So let's figure what that is. Real action to recover a person's lands of which he had been deprived on the death of his ancestor by the abatement of intrusion of a stranger. Ah, right. Okay. And so what this sentence is getting into is what the barons were having enough of. And this was people coming in to take, taking over lands of their heirs before their heirs could take the lands. And so that was this aspect of Mort de Ancestor, right? So this was this, the Mort de Ancestor was real action to recover a person's lands of which he had been deprived on the death of his ancestor by abatement of an intruder. So they're saying, okay, yeah. All right, so let's reread this again, see if we can work this out. So a seizes, so this court of this, this type of jury, of novel de season, meaning the restraint of Mort de Center and of Darien. Now this one isn't in here. Um, Darien presentment, I don't, that sounds like maybe like a kind of summons possibly, uh, shall not be held save in their own counties. Okay, so basically what they're saying is that when you're going to do this thing, to make sure that an heir is going to have his lands and so he's not deprived upon the death of his ancestor. In these types of courts, these Assize courts, a court not always consisting of 12 men summed together to try a disciplinary case, they perform functions of jury, except the verdict was rendered from their own investigation and knowledge and not from upon evidence abducted, that then they have to do it in their own counties and in this way, colon. Okay, so that was a lot to break down for one sentence. Okay, we, or our chief justice, if we shall be absent from the kingdom, shall send two justices through each county four times a year. They, with four knights from each county, chosen by the county, shall hold the aforesaid a seasons in the county, and on the day and at the place of the county court. Okay, so in a sense, what they're saying or locking down here in the same reason why they had to lock down the place that the king couldn't be wandering around, right? And again, this aspect of what we're going to summon you to when the king was summoning people. Okay, so what they're doing here in Article 18 is they are locking all that same kind of thing down from the aspect of the county business. So this is how we're going to deal with county business. So we're going to have these two justices go out and about four times a year with four knights from each county. So that a seize court thing is going to be Two of the king's justices and then four knights from each county chosen by the county shall hold the aforesaid and the assizes in the county. So that's an interesting balance. You have four knights from the county and then two of the king's men, literally. Okay, interesting. And on that day and at the place of the county court. Okay, so wherever they set up the county court at. So that's what they're doing there. But see how long it took to break down just one of these articles? It's <laughs> gets this, this stuff gets interesting. And it's a little bit difficult unless you have someone like Bill that's kind of helped out and put the definitions down here to understand what these things mean going that far back. So I was going to check chat real quick, see if anybody said anything. Bill said, but isn't the debtor really being dead already? No, no, not at all. No, you can be a debtor and not be dead. It, that has nothing to do with owing something someone. Now, if you're talking about your estate or if you're talking about a constructive trust, something that's already a fiction of law, then yeah, that is a dead entity, or a, say a corporation, which is also a fiction of law. Yes, dead entities can owe debt, so I'm not saying that that's not possible. But a debtor is not automatically a dead entity, no. Particularly not back then, because there weren't even that many. Well, there were some corporations around, but uh, they were more in the form of, like I said, the city-states and things like the City of London. So, And yes, we are considered dead under some certain presumptions, like under the Cesar Cave Act of 1666. And yes, we're all considered infants and not yet have come of age in the eyes of the courts. Yes, that's what they're doing. Because what they're doing is they're administering everything. And now, of course, I'm talking about here, now, 2022 in America. What they're doing is they're running private for-profit courts under Roman civil law, but they're running them all through probate, and so that they're administering the abandoned estates of infants who never come forward and make claim to their estate. So then after a certain amount of time, usually seven years, the presumption of death kicks in, so then they're also considered to be, or presumed to be, dead to the law. So you have part of that right, and part of it not, but I just explained the rest of it. Okay, so... 
back to the Magna Carta. So we left off at 19. Okay, so 19. And if on the day of the county court of the afore, the aforesaid assizes, which is that interesting little court of the four knights and two justices, cannot be held, a sufficient number of knights and free tenants from those who were present at the county court on that day shall remain so that through them the judgments may be suitably given according as the matter may have great or small. Okay, so they're saying that if the two justices and the four knights couldn't get around to everything that they needed to do on those specific days, then the sufficient number of knights and just the free men, the free tenants, the free men who were there at the time could take care of the business of the county court. Okay, also logical, makes sense. All right, number 20. A free man shall only be immersed for a small offense according to the measure of that offense. And for a great offense, he shall be immersed according to the magnitude of the offense, saving his contentment and a merchant in the same way, saving his merchandise. Okay, there's some stuff that has to be broken down there. Okay, so first off, so what's an immerse? To impose a fine, also to publish by fine or penalty. So that's that's to immerse. So when we're talking about a free man shall only be immersed, so only be forced to pay for a small offense according to the measure of that offense. So basically, this is where we get in our Constitution, both state and federal, that there shall be no unreasonable bail, right? And well, it's also an aspect of cruel and unusual punishment as well. I mean, we were talking about um, that side of it, but that's what, that, this is where it stems from. The, the idea that if you're going to find someone for something that he's done wrong, then it has to be according to the measure of the offense, right? So again, that's where we get the things that I just aforementioned. And for a great offense, he shall be immersed, fined, according to the magnitude of the offense. Saving his contentment, meaning if he was, if he had content or contempt, I think that actually should be contemptment, but I think that's basically what it means. Um, that's what I think they're getting at, but I'm not sure. Uh, but this part, and a merchant in the same way, saving his merchandise. So merchants had their own laws, which is obviously literally called the law merchant. And part of the aspect of the law merchant was that you couldn't take merchandise from a merchant for an offense that he had done because the merchandise usually actually belonged to someone else, meaning that he was selling it for someone else at the time. And that's all the aspects of, of warehouse receipts and I don't want to get into all the law merchant stuff. But anyway, it's the fact that the merchant had the right not to have that stuff taken from him because it was actually owed to somebody else. So that's why they had to put it in here. So and a merchant in the same way saving his merchandise. So it, you can't take the merchandise of the merchant to force him to pay the, the immersement, which is basically, again, the fine. Okay, so next sentence. And a villain in the same way, if he fall under our mercy, shall be immersed, saving his wainage, and none of the aforesaid fines shall be imposed save upon oath of upright men from the neighborhood. Right. So what is this part? And none of the aforesaid fines shall be imposed save upon oath of upright men from the neighborhood. So from the place that they were being accused of doing something. Now, what does this also mean? It means of upright men of the neighborhood, meaning that it could not be king's men. It couldn't be, say, the two just okay, to go back up to 18 here, say the two justices that went around the counties with the four knights. Okay, so the two justices couldn't just come into the county, accuse someone of doing something, oppose a fine upon him, and then take it. It's basically what that last part of 20 means. It can only be of two upright men of the neighborhood. And upright men meaning men that are known to be good men, not obviously thieves or criminals or villains or, you know, any of that ilk. They had to be good, upright men. And that, to, and to this day, when, and this is still the common law, so when the state accuses you of some crime, whatever, they have to have, still to this day, the oath of the upright men. So they can't be government men. But what is it every single time? It's a cop. Okay. Who does the cop work for? The state. Okay. Isn't that a problem? Well, yeah, for the exception of the fact when you understand that it's all contract. You contracted yourself under Roman civil law by signing that 
license and getting you know putting the plate on the back of your car and registering your vehicle and uh, and then walking into the court and you know the judge saying do you understand the charges against you and you say yes which is another verbal contract you agree to it through the consent of your contractual relationships with the corporate state but if everything were perfect the way it should be then they could never ever do that they could never have a cop testify against you for some crime. But that's not really what they're doing. What they're doing is they're providing evidence to prove that you were in contract at the time. That's really what they're doing, because all crimes are commercial. Part of the Code of Federal Regulations, I just can't remember what part, that states that all crimes are commercial. And of course, that's on the Fed side, but it's pretty much on the state side as well. Uh, even murder is considered a commercial crime now. So they're doing everything through contract, everything through Roman civil law. Uh, but if you guys want to learn more about that, you can listen to the, the all-day court classes that I have on the ins and outs of court and the totality of law class. If you guys want to learn the real whole differences between Roman civil law and, com and common law and all the other aspects of law that I'm not going to get into right now. Okay, so okay, so since number 20 is red here, now this is where we can go back to Bill Thornton's site and go up to the top. And he's got a breakdown for what this basically means so i'm not going to reread it again it just says but this is what it means so here's the here's the article number 20. so he says the fine shall be proportional to the offense and shall only be imposed upon testimony of non-government men which is exactly what i just said okay so that's 20. 21. earls and barons shall not be amenced again fined save meaning otherwise through their peers and only according to the measure of the offense. Okay, so again, so what's the immersed? The immersed is the aspect of the, to impose a fine. And what is a peer? Peer, one who is a member of the peerage, i.e. the nobility. A jury of your peers is a jury of your nobility. In America, everyone is a king without subjects. So a jury of your peers means a jury of people the owners of the country, not citizens who, by the 14th Amendment constitutional definition, are all publicly owned slaves. That's a good way to put it, Bill. And that's exactly the point. So, 21 says that earls and barons shall not be fined, save through their peers, and only according to the measure of the offense. So, Bill says, fines likewise proportional to the offense for the bottom two ranks of the greater nobility. A peer is a member of the peerage. A member of the nobility. A peer does not mean you're equal. Well, I should say it does not only mean you're equal. Because, yes, another member of the peerage is your equal if you're also a member of the peerage. So, yes, you're both a member of the nobility. But the term itself, when people think about it, usually in America, and they say, okay, what you go ask 100 people off the street, what does a jury of your peers mean? They'll say, oh, a jury of my equals and they would be wrong every single time that they said that because they don't understand what the term peer means remember the peerage means and it's a very very important thing and i i told a little snippet of a story last time which if you've already watched number one of this i won't rehash it but it was a, it was an aspect that somebody basically argued this point when they were trying to convene a jury against him. And he said, no, 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 I demand a jury of my peers. And everybody who got on stand on the stand, he asked them one question. Are you a citizen of the United States? And they said, yes. And, and he would say, your honor, this man is disqualified for being able to sit on my jury. Because he wasn't a member of the peerage. But anyway, so I'll just keep going here. So that was 21. So now 22. Uh, so no clerk shall be immersed, fined for his lay tenement except according to the manner of the other persons aforesaid and not according to the amount of his ecclesiastical benefice okay now this is an important part when you're talking about an ecclesiastical benefice so you're talking about a clerk so all clerks you got to remember this clerks are ecclesiastical offices so are notaries a notary is an ecclesiastical office okay so anybody didn't know that okay and so what they're saying, and it's clearly shown here because they're talking about clerks from the standpoint of his ecclesiastical benefice. So no clerk shall be immersed, meaning find or feed, for his late tenement, except according to the manner of the other persons aforesaid. So meaning you can't find him more than the magnitude of the offense. 
and not according to the amount of his ecclesiastical benefice. So maybe he was a really high level clerk in the cult of Rome. Well, or maybe he was like, who knows, the the Pope's clerk or something. Didn't matter. You couldn't find him based upon how high up he was in the priest class is basically what 22 is saying. Okay. So that's important to understand that even in, in the simple reading of the Magna Carta, when you know what you're reading, you can see this huge war between what was considered to be ecclesiastical in nature. Well, another way to put it is what William the Conqueror did when he came over in 1066. One of the things that he did was that he separated the spiritual and temporal courts. He literally gave power. He created a set, the separate courts, the spiritual courts, from the temporal courts. And he gave, what? His serpent sea blind scumbag buddies in Rome power over their own courts. And what did the ecclesiastical sons of bitches have power over? Probate. Yeah, think about it. They dealt with the matter of the property of the dead. And the barons had gotten sick of this after a certain amount of time. They're like, we're not going to go to your ecclesiastical courts and you determine on your own volition who gets our heirs' property or our estates. We, they, they'd had enough of that shit. And surprise, surprise, what's going on right now? Meaning right now in America in 2022. The same damn thing that the barons were so pissed off about. They've created the same system back over top of us without anybody paying attention to how it happened. Or that it's even happening right now. But it's the same thing. It's the same problem. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. All right, let's do 23 and then we'll probably be up at time here. Okay, 23. Well, maybe do 23, 24. All right, 23. Neither a town nor a man shall be forced to make bridges over the rivers with the exception of those who, from an old and of right, ought to do it. So you can't force people to um, to put up infrastructure. It's kind, of, it's kind of what 23 is getting at. Unless there was somebody that already had a bridge and had ought of right to do it, meaning that they maybe they had a, a small creek or something, and their ancestors, ancestors, ancestors had always kept that bridge up and running, of which, by the way, they could ask a toll for. Toll bridges were something that was a fairly regular thing back then. But again, the Magna Carta does bring up toll bridges in a later point, but that's part and parcel of what 23 is getting at. Uh, from old and of right ought to do it. The people that have owned the bridges and have kept them up, you know, should continue to do so. Okay, 24. No sheriff, constable, coroners, or other bailiffs of ours shall hold pleas of our crown. So let's see what Bill's got to say about that one. So, no member of the government may make a complaint against an individual to, quote, hold the pleas of our crown means to sue in the name of the king, or in America, to sue in the name of the sovereign people, i.e. the people of California versus AB. Okay. So again, this gets back to what I was talking about before, this problem where you have nothing but cops bringing up the suit, right? But it, this is what 24 is getting at. No sheriff, constable, coroner, or other bailiff of ours shall hold the pleas of our crown. So in a sense, what does that say? No cop, district attorney, sheriff shall bring a suit against you in the name of the people of California. It has to be the people of California that do it. Well, how is that supposed to be done in the common law system? Well, it's supposed to be done through a grand jury, because that's who the people are. Now, if it's a small offense, again, something like what would be considered a misdemeanor. So something that's a small offense where you say, I don't know, destroyed something that belongs to the people, like, say, a portion of the road. Just to give an example. This probably isn't the greatest example in the world, but it'll make the point. So you do something like that. They've written down somewhere, and even though it be Roman civil law, meaning statute, act, ordinance, or code, to say, okay, that guy owes you know a $500 fine for doing so. An example of that under Roman civil law, a better example of that under Roman civil law, would be like a littering fine 
right? So you're throwing trash out on the side of the road, and they say, nope, you're going to get fined for that. Okay, well, still, it means that the people of California, or the people of the state, the people, the sovereign people, are going to be bringing... So the name of the suit is going to be in the name of the people. It's not going to be in the name of uh, John Henry Doe Sheriff, right? That's the point. So that's what that's what 24 is getting at. Okay, so with that, we came... So we're at 8 o'clock. So we've been in an hour. So I will make a note here to... I'll make 25 green. Save it here so we know where to come back to. And if anyone has anything else in chat, please go ahead and mention it now. And if not, looks like everybody's good. With that said, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and watching and participating tonight. And if you found this class to be informative, please like and subscribe to the Vocational Science Freedom on YouTube and on Odyssey. Uh, because the more you learn, the more powerful you'll become. So until next time, hope all of you have a wonderful rest of your week. And stay safe and stay sovereign.